may be seated. Give me just a moment. I need to take care of a little housekeeping duty here. We are to be the light of the world, so I have to make sure all the lights are on. All right. Good morning. Good to see you today. I love that song to start a worship service with um, because I'm not sure how you arrived today. And you might have arrived here today thinking that you were the center of what was going to happen here. Uh, this isn't about you. Regardless of what's going on in your world today, this service is not about you. It may be exactly what you need, but only if it's not about you. It's not about me. I may be the guy who stands up front more often than anybody else, but if these services ever become about me, you need to find a new place to worship. It is not about them. <laughs> because they just leave. <laughs> it, is, it is about Jesus. It is He is the one to whom we pray. He is the one through whom we pray. He is the direction of our worship. He is the direction of our petitions. The scripture says he is the author and the finisher. And I would suggest to you everything in between of our life of faith. So in spite of the trouble that may have swirled around our world this past week, this moment every Sunday, this first day of the week worship, which it's not the only day you can worship on, but the purpose of the first morning of the first day of the week for the body of Christ to assemble together for the purpose of worship is because the answers to all of our troubles are found in the testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ rose again on the first day of the week. He gave us a fresh start. The Old Testament worship on the Sabbath day was a conclusion of the end of a work week. But the resurrection morning is the testimony to the newness and the freshness of the life that we have in Christ. So, thank you for being here today and knowing it's not about any of us, but it's all about Him. And when we do that, you and I will be blessed beyond measure. I'm glad you're here. If you are a guest with us today, you honor us with your presence at this service. Uh, there's a guest card in the pew. I hope you'll take it, fill it out during our announcements and our offering, and drop it in the offering bag as it comes by. And this week through the mail, we'll send you information that tells you about our church family. I want to direct your attention towards our screen as we look at our morning announcements. Good morning, and welcome to New Hope Community Church. If you're a guest with us this morning, we'd love for you to fill out a Connect card in front of you. This gives us information so that we can send you information about us. Not just what happens here on Sunday morning, but what happens on campus all through the week. Also, if you have prayer requests, put them on the Connect card also, and we meet every Tuesday and pray over all of your needs. So fill one out and drop it in the offering bag when it comes by. Hi, I'm Corey Gallardo. I'm the hostess of the New Hope Women's Facebook page. If you are interested in joining our Facebook page, send a request, a friend request to Fawn Boss, and you can join us. And I post weekly and welcome comments. It's designed for busy women who maybe can't find the time or don't have the, a way to join the other small groups or women's events so we can find community online. Hope to meet you there. Hey guys, it's PFC Robinson. I just got all your letters. I'm about to go pass them out. I just want to say thank you and we appreciate all your support. Hey, my name is Mark Baxter. I'm Brian Muscle. We're from First Platoon, Second Recon, Alpha Company. We just wanted to take the time to say thank you for these letters. We'll make sure everybody in the platoon gets them. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. He's all to us. It's Christmas time, and I'd like to invite you to sign up for the Christmas choir. Uh, if you can carry a tune, we'd like to have you. Soprano, alto, tenor, bass. Uh, and even if you can't carry a tune, we'll help you carry it. 
Uh, rehearsals are Wednesday evenings at 6.30. We'd love to have you there. Hi, I'm Nan Isom. I teach the Tuesday night women's Bible study, and we start again on September the 11th. This time we are going to be doing the book of Ecclesiastes. We meet from 6.45 to 8 o'clock each and every Tuesday. So if you'd like to join us, you're welcome to do so. I'm Tina Brown. I lead the Wednesday morning Bible study, and currently we're in the book of Ephesians. We meet every Wednesday from 9.30 to 11, and then in early November, we're going to dive right into the book of Philippians. Hope to see you there. Thank you. It's that time to show our pastors a little bit of appreciation. Join us on October 7th for Pastors Appreciation Day during the 9:15 and 11 a.m. service. We'd love to be your friend. Why don't you take a moment during Pastor Tim's sermon this morning and like us on Facebook? Oh, just kidding. Like us on Facebook after the service. Uh, Christmas choir. Here's the deal, guys. They're going to start rehearsal in October 630, I believe, is the time that rehearsal is going to start. I would like, your pastor's going to put a big pressure on you this year. I want a 40-voice choir for Christmas this year, okay? There are about a thousand of you who call New Hope home, okay? I am pretty confident that out of that many people, we have 40 folks who can carry a tune. You do not have to read music. It is always helpful, but you do not have to read music. They will help you learn how to sing, all right, in that process. So if you have the ability to carry a tune, you're not going to be asked to dance, so your rhythm doesn't have to be very good. <laughs> You just need to be able to follow along with somebody next to you. It's a great way, one, for you to meet other people. Friendships are forged during that time. Number two, if God has given you that ability, do not waste it. Use it for His glory. I would like some of our high school and college vocalists to join our choir this year. And you are not too old to be in a choir, all right? So... I'm putting the pressure on you. I want a 40-voice choir. I just, I just said they do not have to know how to read music, okay? All right. Um, Sunday school, we have a couple of uh, vacancies now. If you would like to make a difference in the lives of, of young children, why don't you consider volunteering in our Sunday school ministry? Touch base with Jennifer Addis. I don't think, uh, I think only one of them is for a lead teacher. I think they're looking for some other support roles. And if you could be of help in that, why don't you contact Jennifer Addis? By way of the grapevine, I've been told that our parking posse would like to add a few more folks there. You are the first line faces that people see when they arrive at New Hope Church. I got a thank you card from a first time visitor last month who started out. You have no idea the difference it made when I first pulled in and there was a friendly face directing me where to park. And so that's not just to keep us from having traffic jams out there. They are the first line greeters, all right, of folks who come here. And so uh, I think they're also hoping to expand to where we might have some volunteers who could show up occasionally on the nights that we have women ministry activities here. So that there would be someone perusing the parking lot for the entire time that you are here. So the more people who they have on the list, uh, the less demand it is on any one or two individuals. So consider that. And the way you could reach out is just take one of those communication cards and say parking posse. Put your name on it. Someone will reach out and talk to you about that. I don't know if you all saw the tent out here in the pavilion when you arrived, but Shelly and I are not homeless. We are not camping out in the pavilion in a tent. Uh, but that is promoing man camp coming up in the month of October. There is a man camp informational meeting today right after the third service, so right approximately between 12.15 and 12.30. If you haven't signed up, show up. They'll answer all your questions and get you signed up. If you have signed up, show up. They're going to explain what you need to know in order to make your man camp experience all that it possibly can be. I will tell you this, man camp is going to have a little baptismal ceremony while we are there, all right? So uh, that's going to be pretty cool in Shaver Lake in October. 
Yeah, it's going to feel like the baptistry used to before we got the new heater installed, all right? Uh, Sunday nights, um, for the remainder of the year, this year, we're only having Sunday night service on the first Sunday night of the month, all right? We're going through a little uh, rethink and reorganization of Sunday night, and so we're going to be doing that the first Sunday night of the month, October, November, and December. And every one of those uh, Sunday evening services will also be sharing in communion. It will be here in the sanctuary. The service is designed for the entire family. Hope you'll come and join us for some of those Sunday evenings. The first one will be October the 7th, all right? On Pastor Appreciation Sunday, which I have nothing to do with, there will not be an 8 o'clock service. So uh, don't think you can come early and get out of Pastor Appreciation Day, all right? Uh, that we never have it on that day. Uh, all, th- all three services will com- be combined into those two services. I have a special introduction that I want to make to you at the moment. I'm going to ask Teddy and Christy Miller, who were standing in the back, if they would come on up front. All right. Teddy and Christy Miller, as many of you know, Teddy Miller is one of our board members here. Teddy and Christy will be celebrating their 17th anniversary next week. Yeah, isn't that good? We bring everybody up in front of the church in celebration of their 17th anniversary. (laughs) <laughs> That's, I just found that out in the last service, actually, when we did this. Uh, many of you know that, uh, oh, for the last couple of months, are, you wonder what's going on in our youth program. Uh, Pastor Chris had, had resigned and stepped down, and you're wondering, well, what's going to be going on? I would like to introduce to you the new New Hope Youth Director, all right, here at New Hope. So, Teddy Miller. And uh, we know behind every good man is an incredible woman, all right? Uh, And so Christy Miller, they are a team. And he's, yeah, he said he's not, yeah, he's, he's, um, notice I did not call him the youth pastor. He is the youth director, all right? He believes that God has called him to work with the young people, all right? He does not believe God has called him to be a preacher, all right? And that there's nothing wrong with that, all right? Uh, What many don't know is a little over three years ago, I actually asked Teddy if uh, he sensed God directing him because the two of them have been in so engaged for over for about 10 years now with our high school program, uh, so involved with it that I really thought maybe God was directing him in that. And he, three years ago, didn't think that was the case. Uh, when we had this conversation several weeks ago, he said, let me pray about that a little more intently for a few days. And we've had multiple visits and uh, finally said, yes, I'm willing to, uh, to take this next step. So uh, we are so happy to have them on board. And along with this, uh, we have expanded Brittany's responsibilities. Brittany is in charge of our junior high group, uh, but to also assist Teddy, because this is going to be a part-time job for him for a while. Uh, Brittany is going to handle some more of the administrative responsibilities with both high school and junior high. And so we're excited for the team approach that we have to our youth department. So welcome aboard, guys. Thank you very much. So if any of you are parents, all right, uh, of high school kids, you have any questions, we had a wonderful parent meeting uh, a week before last, one of the biggest parent meetings we have ever had, and uh, we introduced uh, Teddy at that time. And uh, we were waiting to introduce them churchwide because we had a little one more step that we needed to go through before we made it a churchwide announcement. And uh, all those hurdles have been done and I's have been dotted and T's have been crossed and we're very excited to have them on board with us here as part of the, uh, the staff at New Hope. So thank you guys. They're having to be here for all three services today. So uh, they've already heard me preach once and they'll tell you once was enough. Uh, all right. I have a couple of prayer requests. One that was handed to me, um, one, uh, from the last service, Fred, uh, as you know, Fred works, uh, from our church works with prison fellowship and, uh, Fred has been invited back to, uh, speak at a, uh, pretty large church in Virginia. He's going to be with the, uh, president of prison fellowship and, uh, they're going to be doing a Q and a in multiple services on a Sunday morning, uh, next week. And so, uh, he is to talk about reconciliation, um, not only individually between a person who was incarcerated and Jesus, but also in race relations. How do you find reconciliation? Because, 
Uh, for those of you who have heard Fred's story in the past, uh, Fred was an Aryan brother. And um, he did some pretty naughty things, both before he went to prison and while he was in prison, before Jesus got a hold of his life. And so uh, he's got a wonderful testimony, and they're going to be sharing that in Virginia. And he wanted us, here was his specific request. He said, pray that my story is his story. And that's a very good prayer request. Uh, This coming week, we have memorial services for Stan Keen. Uh, That is tomorrow at the rodeo grounds. Uh, Stan has been a council member, a mayor. He served over 50 years on the Clovis Rodeo Board. Uh, He served up until last year. He was also the Grand Marshal of the Clovis Rodeo back, I believe, in 2007 or 2008. And uh, if you were here a few weeks ago, you heard me tell the story of the privilege of baptizing him just about 15 hours before he went to heaven. And uh, so we're excited. Uh, His wife wants to make sure that story is told at his service tomorrow. And so be praying for uh, uh, family and friends as they gather tomorrow. And then the Pacini family, another longtime uh, Clovis resident. Uh, Actually, Judy's dad was in my dad's church in Fresno. And dad preached his funeral 35 or 40 years ago and uh, reconnected with his family just about 18 months ago. She's been battling cancer and she went to be with Jesus this past week. And so that service will be uh, this coming week. So if you'd remember them, please. Thank you. Uh, Reba Chamberlain, our 93-year-old who fell and broke her femur. She's doing very well. Thank you for her prayers. And she told me to be sure to pass that on. And we hope in about, I, I am guessing in six to eight weeks, we will see Reba at church again. All right, uh, she is doing that well, so continue to keep her in your prayers. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us while we have our morning tithes and offering. Gentlemen, if you would, please, please join with me as we pray. Father in heaven, I love you so much. I am grateful for who you are and what uh, what you have done for us. Father, it's uh, for many of us showing up at church on a Sunday morning, whether it's 8 or 9, 15 or 11, It's become a habit. It's a routine for us. We do it almost every Sunday. And Father, it's not a bad habit to get into. It's not a bad routine for us to participate in. But Father, if we only come out of habit and routine, then it becomes a mindless activity with very little benefit. I hope that when we leave a service like this, there is a preparation and a sense of anticipation for the next time that we come back to share in the activities of corporate worship and a public feeding of your word. That we recognize, Father, we come so that we can adore you, we can express our love not only personally and privately, but publicly towards you. We can honor you We can demonstrate our trust by giving to you. And then, Father, we open ourselves up for you to encourage us when we are in despair, to strengthen us when we acknowledge our weakness, and to correct us, Father, when we have strayed. So, Father, I I pray that we come to these services with the intent of engaging with you, both publicly and personally. And Father, if we arrived here today and we sort of showed up a bit thoughtless and a little careless, we'll take this opportunity in the quiet of this moment as we pray to rearrange our intentions for the day. The Father will admit to you, maybe we showed up a little sloppy, but we're ready to correct that. We're ready to lift our voice and our hearts as we worship in song with you. We are ready to surrender our needs, our concerns, and even confess, Father, if need be, our sins to you. And then, Father, when your word is opened and your truth is read and the message is shared, we'll be willing to make any life course corrections in our life that you lead us into. Father, what we do when we gather together is not trivial. You genuinely intend for something good to come out of the times when your family gathers together for the purpose of worshiping and declaring your name. 
May we let that take place today with no other distractions. No distractions of what we went through last week. No distractions of what we face for the coming week. No distractions from our cell phones. But Father, a focus. A focus on you for who you are. With a heart of gratitude for what you've done. With a sense of expectancy for what you have yet to do in our lives. For this we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right. You're good. Thank you, guys. Hey, I want to invite you to, uh, if you brought your Bibles with you or uh, your electronic devices that have a Bible on them, please turn to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to be reading from there in just a few minutes. Most of you know, if you've been here during the summer, that we have been engaged in a sermon series on the subject of heaven. And we have discovered that as you talk about heaven, there are a few other subjects that you just can't help but talk about. What are some of those other subjects we've discussed this summer? Hell. hell. That's right. If you're going to talk about heaven, it's kind of hard to ignore hell. Because the same Jesus who preached about heaven also preached three times as much about hell. You can't have the reality of heaven without the understanding of a reality of hell. You can't cherry pick, oh, I want to believe what Jesus had to say about heaven and choose to ignore what he had to say about hell. The flip side is, when you talk about the subject of heaven and hell, there's another subject we can't help but talk about. Death. We can't help but talk about dying because unless we happen to be part of that very select generation that is alive at the moment of the second coming of Jesus Christ, then the only way for us to get to heaven is through the valley of the shadow of death. We cannot help but face death. And of course, having a clear understanding of how incredible and awesome heaven is going to be should give us a sense of expectation and even anticipation to going to heaven. The reality of hell should encourage you and I who know we are on our way to heaven to want to get as many of the folks that we know and even folks we don't know to go along with us. So we've been talking about the subjects of heaven and hell and death. When we talk about the second coming of Jesus one of two things happen with people. They either listen very carefully to find out what in the world is that guy talking about, or we just sort of shut down because this kind of falls into the Star Trek realm of things. I mean, it's, it's, it's fantasy. May I just remind you some things that were fantasy when I was a kid that are reality now? How many of you remember the Jetsons? Oh, yeah, okay. Even, even you guys, you know the Jetsons? All right, good, 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 good. All right. Um, do you remember when the, Je what was her name, Jane? Was it Jane Jetson? You remember when she wanted to talk to somebody on the phone? Was, what was their phone like? It was FaceTime. And we thought, whoa, that is so crazy. We'll never get there. And you all could do that right now on your cell phone that you have in your pocket or your purse. We have exactly what they were doing then. What I haven't seen yet, though, is that little mask that Jane Jetson used to throw up when the phone would ring, and she hadn't been in a shower and done her hair and put her makeup on yet. Do you remember that? She would throw that mask up there, all right, so she looked perfect as she talked on FaceTime. I have FaceTimed a few of you. You really need the mask, all right? I'm, I'm just, just kidding, just kidding. Um. Uh, you know, that's become reality, and yet the second coming to Jesus, the, the, the Scripture says, and, and remember, so many people missed his first coming. No one will miss his second coming. The second coming is public. The first coming had a public announcement. It was, it was publicized that he was arriving, but so few people noticed. His second coming, the Scripture is very clear, everyone will know. 
The scripture tells us he will bust open the eastern skies and everybody will know he's here. And the scripture says a couple of things will happen all kind of simultaneously. It says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Meaning those like my grandparents and my mother who have already lived and died and are buried, the scripture says they will rise first. Now the reason they need to rise first is they, they are a disadvantage. They're six feet under. So just to catch up to the rest of us, they need to start early, okay? So the dead in Christ shall rise first. Physical bodies will be raised from the dead, reunited with their soul and spirit that's been in heaven with God. We've talked about that. There'll be this reuniting of them. And then all of us who were alive at his appearing, we will be caught up, snatched up, one version says, into the air. He's going to destroy heaven and earth. There's going to be a new earth and a new heaven. Don't ask me how all this happens at the same time. I didn't plan it. Okay, I don't, I don't understand how God can do it, but he can and he will. And then you and I and all of the rest of his redeemed will enjoy the new heaven and the new earth forever and ever and ever, and it's going to be an awesome, incredible place. I've shared this on a few occasions, but I think it's been quite a while. It's just, and I don't know if any of you have ever paid attention to the logistics of the way cemeteries are arranged in this country. If you've paid very close attention, you will notice the head is always facing west. Okay? The head is always at the west end of the grave. And there's a reason for that. Because of the passage I quoted to you a moment ago, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So if the head is facing west, when they rise, which way are they going to be looking? East. And it fulfills what the scripture says, that the second coming of Jesus, he is going to bust the eastern. The sun rises in the east. The son of God will come from the east. And when we rise, all of our attention will be on the one who has come. So today, knowing that we've talked about for this summer, heaven and hell and death, we are going to look at what do we do in the meantime? Before we go through the portal of death and we go to heaven or hell, how do we live? What's the direction for us in the meantime? Until he comes again, what and how are we going to live? There was a young lady who busied herself getting ready for a blind date. This was, this was not just going to be a dinner and a movie. She had been informed by her date that uh, he had planned an exclusive downtown restaurant that had live music and dancing. There was a, a waiting list in order to get to this place. Wanting to make a good impression on the first date, she took the day off work. She cleaned her apartment. She went out that afternoon to get her hair done. She got a manicure. When she got home, she did her makeup. She put on the best new dress that she could find. And she was waiting for her date to arrive. His expected time came and went. She continued to wait very patiently. She waited for an hour. She decided she would wait just a little bit longer and finally deciding she had been stood up. She took off her dress. She let down her hair. She put on her pajamas. She gathered all of her favorite junk food and she sat down to watch TV with her dog. About 30 minutes later, now about two hours late, there was a knock at the door. She opened. It was her date. He looked at her rather surprised and said, what? I give you two extra hours and you're still not ready to go? <laughs> Jesus is coming again. And the question for us is, will we be ready for his return or will he catch us unprepared? I, uh, most of you know I grew up at a Baptist church. Um, most of you know Pops. He was my pastor all of my life. Uh, my dad was not a hellfire and damnation preacher, but we were part of a denomination that had its share of hellfire and damnation preachers in it. And since my dad was a pastor in those days, revivals were kind of a big thing. If there was a revival in one of our churches within 100 miles, 
we were going at least a couple of nights that week. So a lot of church services. And when you go to that many revivals, you're going to hear a lot of sermons about Jesus coming again, and I did. And I'll never forget um, some, of the, some of the tactics that preachers in that generation used was if you couldn't draw them to Jesus with love, let's try fear. And uh, I'll never forget hearing multiple times Baptist preachers get into this uh, sort of rhythm of their preaching, and I'm here to tell you, where do you want to be found when Jesus comes again? What if you're in that filthy movie theater and Jesus shows up? <laughs> Any of you ever hear that? Okay, all right, got a few hands going up. Yeah, I, I heard those. And, and the first time I heard that, I remembered, you know what? I had just seen 101 Dalmatians. I didn't think Jesus would mind all that much <laughs> if he caught me there. And their purpose was right. Their process may have been somewhat misguided. Because we have a tendency, if we're not careful in church, that we, um, we preach about our preferences rather than God's specific truth. If we're not careful, we try to make ourselves more spiritual by saying, these are the things I don't do, and we try to see if others measure up in their life by what they don't do as well. And so we have to be careful about that. And I swore that if I ever became a preacher, I would not do that. And, and up until today, I haven't. But today, I'm going to stray a bit. But I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you, where are you going to be when Jesus comes again? What I'm going to ask you is, who are you going to be when Jesus comes again? It's not the where will he find us when he comes that concerns me. It's who are we when he arrives. Peter has some things to say to us about this very subject. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years. And our thousand years are like one day. That's rather peculiar, isn't it? Don't forget this one thing. This sounds like this is really, really important. Peter says, don't forget it. A thousand years is like one day, and one day is like a thousand years. What's he saying? Your time schedule and God's time schedule are not the same. Don't ever try to equate them. God is timeless. Don't, don't allow the time of things to bog you down. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. Sometimes you and I think God is. The, the second coming to Jesus, so many of those first century Christians thought He was coming next week, next month, next year. And Peter's saying, hey guys, <laughs> you're, you're looking at days and months. You're talking about a God who's eternal. A thousand years is a blink of an eye to an eternal God. He, he will not be slow in keeping it. His promises will always show up on time. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Peter tells us in this passage there's something God wants. What is it that God wants? Somebody can answer. Thank you. God wants everybody to come to repentance. Let me ask you another question. Does God always get what he wants? I heard both answers. Unfortunately, in this one, no is correct. Is everybody going to accept Jesus Christ? No. Why? Because God made us in His image, and part of His image was choice, choosing. Not everyone. Jesus Himself said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
So in this case, God will not get what he wants, but his desire is that all come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heaven will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? There's the question, folks. Not where will you be, but who will you be? It's a rhetorical question because then Peter answers it very quickly. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in their heat. There is global warming, folks. Gore was right. (laughs) But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, wow, (laughs) yeah, complete destruction we're looking forward to. No, it's the new heaven and the new earth, the home of righteousness, everything made right. Since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with you about the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters. In other words, (laughs) Paul is consistent speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. For who? Hard to understand for those who are ignorant and unstable people. They distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. In this passage, we discover three things about God. First of all, we discover that God is patient. He says the Lord will keep His promise, and He's slow. He's not in a hurry to bring about this destruction. He's patient, waiting for those to receive Jesus. Jesus will not come again until everyone who's been given the opportunity to receive Christ and who was going to take advantage of it do. That's how patient he is. And God will keep his promise. His promise may catch us by surprise. It says he will come like a thief in the night. Do you know when your thief is going to show up? Always catches us by surprise. But he will keep his promise. And we also find that God has a petition. God has a request. And his request is that you and I who profess to be his children live like his children till either death calls us home or he comes again for us. Well, on one of his expeditions to the Antarctic, Sir Ernest Shackleton was once compelled to leave some of his men on Elephant Island with the intention of returning very quickly for them and taking them back to England. But he was unavoidably delayed. And by the time that he could get back to them, He found to his dismay that the sea had frozen over and his men were cut off from his ability to get a ship to them. He waited a little while and tried again. He waited a while longer and he tried again three times, but his efforts ended in failure. Finally, in his fourth and last effort, he found a narrow channel had opened up through the ice. Guiding that small ship back to the island, he was delighted to find his men not only alive and well, but prepared to get on board, for they didn't know how long that opening would stay there. Very quickly, they were on their way to safety and home. And after the excitement ended, Sir Ernest inquired how it was that this group of men were so ready to get on board so promptly. They told him that every morning, their leader on the island rolled up his sleeping bag, put it into its own bag, and would say to the rest of us, get your things ready, boys. The boss may come today. And folks, the return of the Lord Jesus to this earth is much more certain than Sir Shackleton's return to Elephant Island. Christ's promise to return, to claim his redeemed, is established upon his word 
and his character. The Bible describes this as the blessed hope of all who love him. And so the question is, or the challenge to us, is get your things ready, my sons and daughters. Your father may come today. And if he does, what kind of people will he find? The destruction of our existing earth is not going to be a pretty sight. Cataclysmic, actually. It will make every apocalyptic movie that humans have created seem like an episode of Sesame Street when it happens. It ends in total destruction. And then a new creation. Notice Peter said we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. This is the power of anticipation. In light of the promise of God for our future life, Peter asked the question, what kind of people ought you to be? And then he gives us six very direct answers, very plain for us to see. Live holy and godly lives. Live unafraid. Live by faith. Encourage each other. Be witnesses. Pray. We're going to look at just a couple of those this morning. Peter's encouragement for us begins with a challenge to live now as we will live then holy and godly lives. The word holy means separate and suggests that we live our lives distinctly different from the rest of the world. What does a life distinctly different look like? The the, the Amish have one perspective and I'm not going to tell you it's a bad one. If you've ever been to the Amish country and you talk to them about why do they live still kind of in an outdated way compared to 21st century, they will tell you it is in keeping with the scriptures that they live holy and separated lives. I'm not telling you that externals is the best way to serve a separate life, but I'm not going to tell you it's not either. But what I do believe that we can all agree on is that there must be some internal differences in all of us if we are going to live separated lives different than the rest of the world. I think it's described to us well in two places. First in Philippians 3, 19 through 21, where the Scripture says, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our, our, Paul says, those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly body so that we will be like His glorious body. The contrast is is those who don't know Jesus live very selfish lives. Those who love Jesus have been called to live a selfless life, and it should be distinctive in the choices that we make and the things that we do. Paul amplifies on this in the book of Galatians. When in Galatians chapter 5, we are challenged to look at this comparison. It was, uh, and what did I do with my bulletin? Because I wrote a note down from the song Redeemed that we sang In that song, Redeem, were these words, I don't have to be the old man inside of me. I'm not who I used to be. That is what Paul talks about in the book of Galatians chapter 5 when he says in verse 13, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in the single command, love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, talking bad about one another, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature, the old man that that song is talking about. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so you do not know what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Who's running the show in your life? I'm not talking about going to the show now. I'm talking about who's running the direction of your life. If it is your sinful nature inside of you, the Scripture says it's going to be obvious. You'll do things that are sexually immoral. You'll do things that are impure. You'll be engaged in debauchery. Some of you are saying, oh, I'm I'm good so far, Tim. 
You'll get caught up in idolatry and witchcraft. Nope, don't have any idols or witches in my house. Notice it's the man who's laughing with that pause right there. No, it's the next phrase that I'm getting to that I'm pausing over. Because now Paul really meddles. What about hatred? What about discord? What about jealousy? Fits of anger? Selfish ambition? Dissensions? Factions? Envy? Drunkenness? Orgies? And in case he left anything out, he said, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and a life under control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature and its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Which list best describes you? The old man inside of me or the new creation of Jesus Christ in me? There's a civil war going on in your life. You got two dogs raging inside of you. Abraham Lincoln one time was asked which dog was going to win. He said, the one I feed the most. Which nature are you feeding? The old man or the new creation in you? Your sinful bent or your position of sainthood in Jesus Christ? Those who don't believe in Jesus or desire to be residents of his eternal kingdom have nothing to look forward to after death. Their God is their stomach and therefore they bow down to the extraction of as much pleasure from the short life as possible. Their mind is set on earthly things. A person who doesn't believe in God has no one to answer to except for themselves. Essentially, they have no moral absolute, no right or wrongs. The logical conclusion then is eat, drink, and be merry. Consume yourself in selfishness, pleasurable living with regards for no one else. And you know what? Paul agreed with that conclusion. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, if the dead are not raised, then eat, drink, for tomorrow you die. But he goes on to say, we have a different destiny. Jesus did rise from the dead, and so shall we. Believers in Jesus have passports with no expiration date, signifying that our citizenship is in heaven, and that old gospel song is true, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. We are from a place where righteousness dwells and we should act today as if we are ambassadors from our homeland. I just saw a poster this week. Don't give your boyfriend husband privileges. Parents, what do you say to that one? Don't give your boyfriend husband privileges. Now, for you parents of uh, young men, Don't give your girlfriend wife privileges. Some of you are saying, Tim, why are you just picking on the boyfriends and the girlfriends? It's because I didn't see any cute poster talking about gossip or porn, laziness or addictions, unkindness or jealousy, selfishness or lust this week. But I'll go looking for them next week. But just because we know God will one day finish his perfecting work in us doesn't mean we shouldn't let him work on us now. We also need to live unafraid. Jesus gives us a second piece of advice in John 14. When Jesus was facing his betrayal, his arrest, his beatings, his humiliation by being stripped naked and paraded down the street and eventually his crucifixion, Jesus gathered his disciples close and he gave them one last devotional message. Jesus told his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me, for I am God. Jesus turned to them in their anxious moments when they discovered that Jesus was going to be departing soon and they couldn't go with him. And he gave them reassuring words, don't let your hearts be troubled. There's two parts to a troubled free heart and a trouble-filled world. Number one, we must choose to live without being afraid. 
Tim, how do I do that? I'm just, I, I, I'm fearful by nature. How do I live? Choose. Decide who is with us. Remember who is the source of our strength. I am not the most courageous guy in the world. But growing up, I was the smallest kid in school. I was accused of being the leader of a gang when I was at Winchell Elementary School. <laughs> By my third grade teacher, I wasn't the member of a gang. I just chose to have friendships with the two biggest guys on campus. Okay? I never walked around afraid because I had friends who would take care of me. I have a Savior who's better than any friend on earth. I had people ask me on this, this river ride down to Colorado where we were going through rapids ranked 8 to 9 on a scale of 1 to 10. Tim, were you ever afraid? And I had to really answer, no, I really, I wasn't. Not once. I mean, it's exciting. Not an adrenaline rush, but never afraid. And, and there were two reasons for the lack of fear. One is I had seen the videos of other people doing this. Those were advertisements encouraging us to go. I knew if that company had lost very many lives, they wouldn't still be in business. Yeah, they had to make sure you live. And second of all, you know what? I wasn't doing something stupid. I mean, basically. <laughs> I wasn't being presumptuous. And if God wanted me, it didn't make a difference if I stayed home or I was on the Colorado River. God was going to take me. And if he wasn't ready for me yet, then I'm okay. Please understand, I said I wasn't being presumptuous. You can't jump in front of a truck and say, if it's not my time to go, I'm not going to die. No, no, that's, that's tempting God. But choose to live without being afraid. Choose to live filled with hope. J.I. Packer said, for a Christian to have hope, they must believe in the promise and they must trust the one who is making the promise. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, I'm your source of strength. Jesus said, I am your ever-present help in a time of need. Jesus said, I'll walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. You should fear what? No evil. Hope and courage are tethered together in our belief system. How well do I know Jesus? And how far am I willing to trust him? If I am still fearful and hopeless, then here's the conclusion that will be right to make. If you are still fearful and hopeless, you don't know him well enough. And as a result, you are not trusting him near enough. It's like the woman on her first airline flight sitting very nervous and scared in her seat and the seat next to her is an eight-year-old girl playing with her doll. And the woman looks over to her and says, oh dear, you must be so nervous. I'm glad you've got your doll to keep your mind off of being afraid. And the little girl looked at her and said, I'm not afraid, are you? The woman looked back at her and said, yes, I've never flown before. I'm terrified. And the little girl looked back at her and said, honey, you've got nothing to worry about. And the woman looked back at her and said, how can you say that? What do you know that I don't know? And the little girl said, the pilot, he's my daddy. <laughs> Who do you know? If you know Jesus, then God is your father. And he says, I love you like my own because you are my own. Let me wrap up. Paul Stanley tells this story from his military experience. As an infantry company commander in Vietnam in 1967, I saw Viet Cong soldiers surrender many times as they were placed in custody, marched away, and briefly interrogated. Their body language and facial expressions always captured my attention. Most of them hung their heads in shame, staring at the ground, unwilling to look their captors in the eye. But some stood erect, staring defiantly at those around them, resisting any attempt by our men to control them. They had surrendered physically, but not mentally. On one occasion, after the enemy had withdrawn, I came upon several of our soldiers who were surrounding a wounded Viet Cong soldier. Shot through the lower leg, he was hostile and frightened, yet he was helpless. He threw mud and he kicked with his one good leg when anybody came near him. When I joined the circle around the wounded enemy, one of the soldiers in my command looked up at me and said, Sir, what do we do? He's losing blood fast. He needs medical attention. I looked down at the struggling Viet Cong and I saw the face of a 16 or 17-year-old boy. I unbuckled my pistol belt. I took off my grenade pack so that he couldn't grab any of them. And then I spoke very gently as I approached him. 
He stared fearful at me as I knelt down beside him, but he allowed me to slide my arms under him and pick him up. As I walked with him towards a waiting helicopter, he began to cry and hold me tight. He kept looking at me and squeezing me even tighter. We climbed into the helicopter and we took off. During the ride, our young captive sat on the floor, clinging to my leg. Never having ridden in a helicopter, he looked out with panic as we got altitude and flew over the trees. He fixed his eyes back on me and I smiled reassuringly. I put my hand on his shoulder and said, it'll be fine. After we landed, I picked him up again and I walked him towards the medical tent. And as we crossed the field, I felt the tenseness leave his body and his tight grasp loosen. His eyes softened and now like a child, he laid his head against my chest. The fear and the resistance were gone. It finally surrendered. That is the way it can be when you and I choose to surrender to God. I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Amen. My marriage, my kids, my job, my health, my cancer, my bills, I surrender it all. So many times we see God as our enemy and we fight Him, claiming our own territory and the right to our own lives. But in our woundedness, we finally see that the God to whom we surrender, He is not our enemy. He cares for us and He heals us and He takes us as His very own. So the key questions to walk out of here with today is how well do you know Jesus? What are you doing to get to know him better? In the second half of my life, I've discovered an important principle. Solving a problem is not so much figuring out the right answer. For that is not as important as trusting the right person. I've given up trying to look smart because I've discovered it's not important, as important as being weak so that Jesus is my strength. Remember, the worst thing that can happen to us is death, and Jesus has that problem covered. So how do we live now in the light of our guaranteed future? We should live without fear and without worry, and we should be thinking about not where will I be when Jesus comes, but who will I be when he arrives? Let's pray. Our Father, you gave, uh, you gave Peter some pretty direct words to share with us 2,000 years ago. You gave him those words by the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit in him. And you can bring those words to reality and to life in us by that same spirit that prompted him to write them. You will now carry them out in us. And so if we arrive today, fearful or reckless, may we leave here today with an assurance that you can cast out all fear and that you are in the business of transforming us day by day to who we will be forever in eternity. And I pray that you will find many of us giving you permission to be about your business in our lives. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Go we'll have a great day, guys. Fear not. <laughs>